Jonah chapter 4, we're wrapping Jonah up today. I don't know about you, but I have learned tremendously over the last month, pressing in. And I've known this, I've known this story of Jonah. Like, I was raised in a pastor's home, so I remember in Sunday school getting taught Jonah. We were so old school it was back in the day, this thing called a flannel graph board. We had these little characters, and you put it up there, and that was Jonah. And the lesson before, the same guy was Abraham, and the lesson before, he was Moses. But it didn't matter because this time he's Jonah. Like, I, I have known that story since my childhood, and yet I have learned tremendously new things. Even, even in today's chapter, chapter 4. So let me lay just a little bit of groundwork uh, about this chapter that I think will help us as we go into it. All right, so let me say this. If Jonah, the book, had ended with chapter 3, Jonah may very well have gone on record as the best prophet ever. Think about it. The dude gets a call from the Lord. He runs from God. God saves him with a great fish. He gets vomited up on the land. He goes, he preaches a simple message, and it wasn't a pleasing tickling the ear. It was like, right? Like, like God's going to overthrow the city. 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Justin, like, hammered that home last week. And what happens? A whole city repents and turns to God. And if, and if it finishes and stops there, you're like, oh my gosh, Jonah. But then there's chapter four. <laughs> How many of you have read ahead and you've read chapter four already? Okay, a number of you. So here's the deal. Chapter four was included to remind us that God doesn't just look on the outward things, but even more importantly, he cares about our hearts. And here's what chapter 4 is going to reveal. Jonah's heart was in the wrong place. What he did was right. The attitude he had about it was absolutely wrong. And so it like just peels open the layers and we really get to see what he's really thinking and what really is motivating him. So a couple quick other things. If in Jonah 1, for those of you who have been with us for the whole series, if in Jonah 1, Jonah's like the prodigal son that runs from the father, here in chapter 4, he's like the older brother. And he's self-righteous, and he's judgmental, and he's angry at God's mercy and grace and love and forgiveness. (laughs) So here's a thought that hit me this week. So let me drop this one on you. Write it down. Think about it. Put it on the rotisserie grill of your mind and turn it around. And I think we could sum this up every way. The heart of every problem is the problem of the heart. At the end of the day, the heart of every problem is the problem of the heart. So if we change a heart, we can change problems. And I'm not saying behavior modification isn't good and can't help. There are times for that. But at the end of the day, we want to get to the root of everything. It's the heart. That's why God cares most about our hearts. Because if our hearts change, our lives change. We can modify behavior and never change our hearts. God is not interested in behavior modification He's interested in changing our hearts. And that's what Jonah 4 really reveals to us. And then chapter 4 also, again, this is all just sort of foundational as we get ready to read. Chapter 4 also shows, listen, God tenderly and gently dealing with his servant who had a pretty rotten heart. And I take great comfort in that. Because sometimes, if I'm being purely honest with you today, my heart's not in the right place. Sometimes it's not. And I'm so glad that God dealt so tenderly and patiently with Jonah, and I'm so glad that he does the same for me today. And might I add, I'm so glad he does the same for you as well, too. There's a prayer we're going to see right off the top. He prays a prayer. If you've been with us, you'll click and say, oh, wait, he prayed a prayer earlier. So there's two prayers in four chapters. If you're unfamiliar, the first prayer he prays is as he's sinking in the depths, he's going to die, and then he's swallowed by a fish, and he prays this, prays this incredible prayer from the belly of a fish. The second prayer is right here as he's sort of sitting and waiting for God to absolutely destroy with divine judgment this wicked city. So here's what's interesting. In the first prayer, you could say he prayed his, he prayed his best prayer in the worst place. And then now, in chapter 4... He prays his worst, his worst prayer in the best place. 
Because what's happening is God's saving a city, but he prays an absolutely awful prayer. You're going to see it in just a moment. The first prayer came from a broken heart and a repentant heart. He was turning back to God. The second prayer came from a prideful, self-righteous, angry heart. In the first prayer, God, uh, first prayer, he asked God to save him. In the second prayer, and you're going to see this not once, not twice, but three times, he asked God to take his life. I mean, he was bummed out. He was bummed. And so let's take a look. Now, before we read together, if you're new with us, we've been every Sunday, we've been reading each chapter together as a body. I love hearing you read the word of God aloud. But let me read the end of chapter three because it sets up when we start with chapter four, verse one. All right, so here's how chapter three ends. Remember, Jonah has gone. He's preached a simple message. 40 days and then will be overthrown. The whole city turns back to God, even the king. It's amazing. And what happens, verse 10 says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. So that's the scene, right? Now, let's begin Jonah four, verse one. Together, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is. <laughs> and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Go to the next verse, James. James, next verse, please. You can't, no, it can't stop there. It stops there. No, I just, every time I read that, I'm like, no, Jonah, give me more. What happened? Did, did you go back? What, what happened to the city? What happened to you? Did you finally obey? Did you actually care for the people? Did you run away? What happened? Give me more. And he just doesn't. He just doesn't. Fun Bible trivia. There's only two books out of 66 books in the Bible that end with a question. Jonah and Nahum. And both of them have to deal with the city of Nineveh. So if ever you have a Bible trivia, pack that one away and you'll fool everybody. All right? So I, there's so much here. Does, does that... Is it just me or does that amaze you to like, what is he doing? How, how can, what, why are you mad? How, 
Okay, let's just go to some verses, because I, I just, verses one to three. The Bible says that to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. The phrase in the Hebrew means literally to be evil or bad. So I want you to catch the grasp of it. So here's what Jonah was thinking. Jonah considered the deliverance of Nineveh to actually be evil or bad. Like God was so far off base. The Bible says he became angry. And it wasn't like he just threw a little temper tantrum. The word means like to burn, to be hot with anger. You could literally say Jonah was burnt up with anger towards God's salvation of a whole city. And here's the deal. Jonah did not want the Ninevites forgiven. He wanted them destroyed. So here's what's interesting to me. There's so much irony in this whole chapter. Like, think about this. God turned from anger. Jonah turned to anger. <laughs> God turned from the eminent destruction that was threatened and in turn saves an entire city. And Jonah gets peeved about it. And he gets angry because of God's grace and mercy. Now, I don't know if you caught it, but Jonah revealed, if you wondered in chapter one, like why did he do this Jonah John, the rebellious runner, and he runs from God? Like what was his real reason for doing that? He tells us here in this prayer. Did you catch that? He's like, see, I knew it. I knew that you wouldn't kill him. I'm doing a slight paraphrase. I knew that you wouldn't wipe him out, and I was so looking forward to that. I so wanted to see the hellfire and brimstone fall on these people. And I knew that if I went, and I knew that if I told them and preached this, I knew that if they turned, I know you, God, and I knew you would save them. And I shake my head, and I'm like, what in the world? Jonah would rather see a city of people destroyed than their, than their salvation. <laughs> but now, in the prayer, oh, he mentions four things about God. And it's not just what he does, it's in his character. Did you notice that? He talks about his character. All right, here's the four things real quick. He says, first of all, you are gracious. God's gracious. Grace is giving someone something they don't deserve. So we're on good footing to say God is so gracious to us that he does not give us what we deserve. Because we deserve to be separated from him. We deserve to be parted from him we, we, because of who we are, because of our sin. But God doesn't give us that. He's so gracious to us. Secondly, he goes, you're compassionate. That word literally means tender in his affection. Like just a compassionate God. Thirdly, he says, you're slow to anger. Whew. We could say it like this. Slow to anger. That's why James says in the New Testament, in the first chapter of his letter, that we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry as followers of Jesus. Because this is in the nature and the character of God. You say, uh, PM, how do you know? How do you know God's slow to anger? I would say, look around. The fact that we're still here is the fact that he's slow to anger. Right? We woke up today with breath in our lungs. We, we, we've, we've been given eternal life. Like he saw us in our dire, desperate need. He didn't leave us to figure it out. He sends Jesus as his gift, as his offering of salvation. He invites people to turn from their own selves and to believe in Jesus. And when we do, he gives us eternal life. He's slow in his anger to us. What? Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. A lot of people want to portray God as quick to anger and this God of harsh Judgment, And the fact of the matter is, all throughout Old and New Testament, we actually see just the opposite. That God, in his nature, is slow to anger. And then finally, he goes, you're abounding in love. Overflowing. It's the most used Hebrew word to describe the love of God hundreds of times in the Old Testament. It means, check this out, loyal love. 
It's a loyal love. And he said, God, this is who you are. And I knew it. I knew it. Because this is who you are, I knew you wouldn't do this to these people. And they so deserve it. So what happens? Or or what is actually going on here? All right. Let me say it like this. Jonah was repulsed by the repentance and revival in Nineveh. It is possible, like, because, because, I don't know, I want to dig in, like, why, why did this bother him so much? Why, why? And I think at part is this, which can expose, or at least potentially should cause us to ask a question of ourselves. So let me, let me unpack this. It's quite possible that Jonah cared more for his own reputation than he did for God's. You say, oh, how? Well, think about this, right? Jonah is called by God to take a message to Nineveh. And what was the message? If you were here last week, if not, you just read it. It's, it's right there in whatever verse that is. I don't know, whatever that is. I can't see. Four. Um, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That is not a message of grace and love and compassion. That's a judgment. That's total judgment. And I envision Jonah like, man, I can preach this message. Yeah, and he's just 40 more days, and he's going, he just booms, and yes, yes, 40 more days, 40 more days, and people, he's just feeling it so good, right? And all of a sudden, people start breaking, and people start turning to God, and follow me, in his mind, as a prophet who was called to speak for God, all of a sudden, the very thing that he is saying is going to happen doesn't happen. And he's like, what are people going to say about me? My prophet uh, status is sort of going to take a big hit here. God, what are you doing? What are you up to? You're saving these people, but I preached the message of this, but you're doing this. Oh, and all of a sudden, right, it's almost like he cares more about his own reputation than he does about God. Hmm. So listen, oh, Jonah had so quickly forgotten God's mercy for him when he was inside the fish. Let me say it another way. Jonah was happy when God saved him, but angry when God saved Nineveh. If you're like me, you go, dude, what a, you you <laughs> What's wrong with you? You are messed up. Hang on, time out, because God just sort of raped me over the coals this week. Is it possible? Because here's the posture of Jonah's heart. They don't deserve your forgiveness. Therefore, they don't deserve mine. Is it possible that some of us are like Jonah today and we don't even realize it. And the posture of our heart towards someone, somebody, some group of people, is they don't deserve forgiveness. Ooh, it got quiet real quick. (laughs) Pick up your toes. Pastor's stomping on them. Hang on, hang on. Like, this is a good message. This is, this is not a message of condemnation. Like, we need to be called out on this. I mean, we said chapter four is in here for a reason, right? So, so let me go here. Is there somebody in your frame that you're withholding forgiveness for? Is there somebody in your picture of peace that you should be at peace with, but when their, their face comes into that frame, It's nothing but anger. You wish destruction and hatred and God's full vengeance and wrath and repercussion of everything that they've done to you that they get it 10 times over. And you've made statements like, in this life, I will never forgive them. That's Jonah. That's Jonah. Now, here's the deal. If if that happens to be you today, here's the good news. God is full of grace and compassion. He's slow to anger. 
even with you and me, when we have a posture like that. And he's, listen, he's abounding in love, not only towards you, but he's abounding in love towards that person that you've chosen not to forgive yet. That ex-spouse, that parent, that former coworker. This, I believe, is why chapter four is here to sort of reveal the heart and to call us back to call us back to the understanding of who God is and to live our lives out in light of who God is. God, help us. Even if we look or cast judgment on segments or populations of society that live or think differently than us, and somehow we feel they are more worthy of God's destruction. God, help us. We need to have the heart of God beating in us that, God, we want to see all come to saving grace in Jesus. That God loves every single person right where they're at. And he's inviting them into this incredible, intimate, sweet, sweet intimacy with him, right? So God asked Jonah a question. Did you notice that? What did he say to Jonah? Is it right for you to be angry? Isn't it he didn't say, are you angry? Or he didn't even say, why are you angry? He said, is it right? You talk about getting to the heart of the matter. He's talking about his motivation. Is it right for you to be angry? Well, what's the answer to that? No. (laughs) It's implied, but I ask you this question. Did Jonah answer the question? No. He just like, "Uh, uh, I don't want to deal with that right now. Typically, when people don't ask answer questions like that, that's usually a sign like, you know, they're right. You know, you're wrong. You know, you don't have the conversation, so I'll just walk away from it. And that's what Jonah did. He walked away from it, and what did he do? He walks, to the, he walks uh, up to the east side of the city. By the way, the east side was the highest part of the city. It was an elevated. So he could sit up on the highest part and look out over the city. And what, what does it say that he does? So he, in verse 5, he sits there and he waits. Well, what was he waiting for? Well, you know, he's already been revealed what's in his heart. He's thinking this. Ah, okay, you know what? This whole uh, change thing, it's not real. So if I just wait up here long enough, I know what's coming. And I, wanna, I do want to see some hellfire brimstone. So I'm going to wait it out. Let's see what happens. That's what he's literally doing. He's, he's waiting for this. Now, a thought hit me this week I've never, ever contemplated until now. Have you ever considered this? that the people actually needed Jonah in the city. You say, why? Well, these are people, they did not follow Jehovah. They didn't know anything about him. This prophet comes in and preaches a, a message of doom. They repent from the king to the animals, right? They're in sackcloth, they're in ashes, and they turn to God But they don't know what to do. Who's going to teach them, like, what does following Jehovah look like? Like, like what are his laws? What are his expectations? What does it mean? And there was only one person that I can tell based upon this particular story. There was only one person that could, if you will, disciple them or show them. Who was it? Jonah. But he leaves the city. At probably their greatest time of need, he bails and he goes outside to wait and hope and even maybe pray deeply in his heart that these people would just be consumed. And they needed him. In the deepest they needed him, they're discipling them. I just find that so, so fascinating. So here's what's clear to me at this point, right? It is evident that Jonah had no love in his heart for these people. There was no love in his heart for the Ninevites in any way, shape, or form. Now, verses 6 through 8, probably, just me, probably my favorite part of the story right here. Verses 6 through 8. So what happens? Let me read it real quick, and I want to show you something. God gave me a visual illustration of this a couple weeks ago. Verse 6, then the Lord God provided, I have that part, three different times you see provided in these short little verses here. The Lord God provided a leafy plant, made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And notice this. He was angry about God not destroying us. He was angry about God saving the city. But what was he happy about? The plant. I love my little plant. (laughs) You're so good to me. I was in discomfort. I was hurting. My head, he probably had a bald head. That's why it talks about his head. 
And if there's bald heads in the room, I see them. Love you. I'm not saying it's just an explanation, right? Be careful. Wear your sunscreen, please, on your head. That can happen, right? But he was in discomfort. And he was like so miserable. There's proof to be had that, that the physical discomfort was magnified by his emotional and internal discomfort. You ever been like that? When you're discomforted inside, you're actually in discomfort on the outside. And there's proof, I don't have time to dig into it from the text, that that's, it was like this, a, a holistic discomfort was going on. And so he builds this little shelter, but it wasn't enough. And he's sweating. You ever been hot and humid? And so I did a wedding yesterday. And they're here today. Doug and Doris are here. I did their wedding yesterday. Praise God. And yeah, we worked that in. It rained, it rained all day yesterday, and it was an outdoor wedding. And there were some serious prayers being prayed to Jehovah God yesterday. And I don't know, mid-afternoon, he stops the rain. And we started the wedding, and we get up there, and the cloud, I'm not exaggerating one bit. The clouds parted, and the sun came out. And like Jonah, I was in great discomfort while thoroughly enjoying myself. <laughs> it was so hot and so humid. I'm not exaggerating. I was standing up there, and sweat was dripping off my nose. I had to apologize for, like, wiping sweat off my nose. Jonah was just, ah, oh, he just felt awful. So God's like, all right, I'm going to take care of your, your uncomfortability. And he provides a plant. And this plant has big old leaves on it, shade. And he's like, oh, sweet relief, little plant, I love you. You are my salvation. I don't care about those people. Okay, watch this. I don't care about those people. I care more about something else. And God knew it, so what did God do? The very next day, in the same way he provides a plant, now he provides a worm. Remember chapter one, he provides a whale, if you will, now he provides a worm, from the biggest to the smallest. And a little worm, plant, and all of a sudden, he's discomforted again, and now he's ticked. So I want to, I want to show you something. God will often give me visuals, or he will let me interact with or something to reiterate scripture that I'm preaching on. So uh, a couple weeks ago, God gave me a right in my face visual illustration of the worm eating the leafy plant. So I want to show you. This happened to me two weeks ago. James? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. See that little guy? You see him eating that green leafy plant? That was my dinner two weeks ago. Lillian makes this chicken Caesar salad. One of our favorite meals was. And we're eating, and all of a sudden, two-thirds of the way through the meal, that's what I saw. Exactly. I was grossed out. I was a... True story. Lillian, my wife, looks at me, and she says, it's just a little worm. Just flick it off and eat the rest. I'm like, woman, I don't know what kind of demonic spirit is on you right now, but I cast it out in Jesus' name. I ain't eating that. Oh, come on. It's just, I'm like, I may have already eaten five worms. I may have worms. I'm like, Jonah, I'm in great discomfort. And she stuck to her gun. She goes, oh, you quit being a baby. <laughs> what is wrong with her? So a week later, we, we, we basically have chicken Caesar salad once a week. Twice, my daughter says twice a week. Then. So it was about a week later, me, Lillian, my other son, Zach, was, and so I had forgotten about that. Thank God. And I'm eating my salad, and my son goes, oh, hey, is that the same lettuce that the worm was in before? <laughs> what? I just want to enjoy my salad. And God's like, oh, no, I'm going to show you Jonah. This is Jonah. This, this worm ate the green leafy, and Jonah was, <laughs> and so what happened? So, so Jonah's happy about the plant, and then he's unhappy about the plant not being there, and then what does God say to him? So this is, I think, really building to the crux of this, and then we want to take communion here. Verse 9, but God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? This time he answers it. I could just see him, like, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? He's like, yes, yes, it is, Jesus. It's why I have every right to be angry about this. 
That was my little plan. He provided shade. We grew close in such a short period of time. God, that was my plan, and you killed my plan. And God says, <laughs> and, and now I wish I were dead. And God's like, this is going to be the Mike Joy perverted version. Bro, <laughs> Jonah, bro, are you kidding me right now? Your concern is my version. Your concern about a stinking little plant that you had nothing to do with making it spring up. You had nothing to do with killing it. And while you're concerned about a plant and your own personal comfort, I'm concerned about people. And there's the heart of the matter. So let me ask us a question in the room today. Because this is where it just gets in our grill, possibly. Are we more concerned with our own personal comfort than we are about people? I ask you that question. I can only answer for me. But I, I think that's a question we need to wrestle with. And I'm not saying we aren't. I'm just asking the question. Because you know what? God asked me that question. And I think there are times in my life and opportunities when I'm given and I choose to be comfortable over caring for people. If I'm just being honest. It's not all the time. And I promise you, it's not the posture of my heart. But doggone it, sometimes my flesh gets in the way. And I think you're probably like me in some way, shape, or form. And so I think what God, what God was trying to show Jonah, and isn't it cool, like, like again, th this isn't like some, uh, this is beautiful. Because God is being so patient and tender and gentle with Jonah. I mean, he, he, God could like, all right, you feel that way? I'm going to infest you with worms. Here's boils. Here's whatever. And he did. He's like, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? Are you sure? Jonah, do you, do you care more for a plant than you do for people? Because, like, remember what you said about my character and you're my prophet? And, oh, by the way, Jonah, like, I'm dealing with you right now with so much grace and so much tender mercy. And all the way, like, yep, you're right, God. You're right. So true. So true. This is my personal opinion. Okay, so this is not in the Bible, so I could be absolutely wrong. But because Jonah wrote this letter, hence the name Jonah, I think at the end of the day, at some point in time, Jonah recognized God's grace to him and his mercy towards him. And I personally, just, I have no proof, but I just personally feel in my spirit that he actually got himself right with Jehovah and he went back to the city. I really do. It's just, this is my own two cents. Take it for what it's worth. Don't spend it anywhere, okay? <laughs> we don't know for sure because the text doesn't tell us. But here's what I do know. And I want to close with this as we take our communion together. Did you know that Jesus points to Jonah and that Jonah points to him? So let me wrap up because we do want to make this about Jesus. Even though it's the story of Jonah the Old Testament all looks ahead to the coming of the Messiah. And, and we see this. So listen to what Jesus said. And uh, as I'm reading this, if you didn't get your communion elements, I want to invite you, put your hand up right now so we can make sure to serve you as we prepare for our communion today, all right? I'm going to read this scripture from Matthew 12. Matthew 12, verses 39 to 41. Here's Jesus speaking. Look at what he says. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Oh, he said, so Jonah was a sign of me. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the son of man will be, speaking of himself, Jesus, in the grave, in the tomb, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But look at the next verse. Even talking about Nineveh itself and the way they turn to God. Matthew 12, 41, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation, his generation, and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. 
Watch this. And now something greater than Jonah is here. Do you know who the something or the someone is? It's Jesus. If I may, Jesus is literally saying, I'm the greater Jonah. I'm greater than Jonah in every way possible. And his hearers would have been familiar with, with this Old Testament book. So how is Jesus greater than Jonah? Well, listen to this. Number one, Jesus is greater than Jonah in his very person, in his essence. Jonah was a Jew, he was a prophet, and he was a child of God. Jesus himself, according to the scriptures, was a Jew, was the prophet, but was also the son of God. Jesus is greater than Jonah in his message. Do you notice Jonah preached a message of judgment? Jesus preached a message of grace and salvation. Jesus is greater than Jonah in regards to sin. Jonah almost died for his own sins. Jesus died for the sins of the world. Jesus is greater than Jonah in his ministry. Jonah's ministry was to one city. Jesus' ministry is to every city and every person in every city. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Jesus is greater than Jonah in his obedience. Jonah's obedience was not from the heart, as we've seen today. Jesus' obedience was only to please the Father's heart. Jesus is greater than Jonah in his love. Jonah did not love the people he came to save. Jesus had compassion and love for sinners, and he proved his love for us sinners by dying on the cross. And then listen to this, finally. Jesus is greater than Jonah in his heart for people. In his heart for people. Consider this. Jonah waited outside the city to see if God would kill those he would not forgive. Jesus hung on a cross outside a city and asked God to forgive the very ones who killed him. <laughs> and so we... How do, you, how do you finish a book that finishes with a... You finish it with Jesus. Because this was pointing to Jesus. And we continue to turn our hearts. And the grace, the compassion, the slow to anger, the abounding of love, the greatest demonstration of that nature and character of God is found in Jesus Christ who displayed God's grace and compassion and love and slowness of anger. And he continues to do so today. So we turn our hearts, finishing with Jonah, and we turn our hearts to Jesus. And it's with grateful hearts and thankful hearts, and maybe even for some of like, God, clean out my heart. I'm sorry. I'm forgiving. Uh, I, I'm letting go of feelings and thoughts towards people. And instead, I want to have your love in me and your love through me today.